and he will speak about statistics of L functions. Thank you, Julio. And it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to commend the organizers for putting together this uh, really great program. And it's just wonderful to have number theory and physics in Brazil. And uh, we should all be very happy that this is the beginning of something that will go well into the future and develop handsomely, we hope. Uh, <coughs> So I want to talk about uh, statistics of L functions, and in particular, about the story that's emerged really a lot over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so uh, that uh, involves uh, number theory and random matrix theory uh, putting together what I would say right now is a, a fairly complete picture of how uh, the values of L functions in families are distributed and how the zeros of L functions in families are distributed. And we can see these uh, now, I think, as, as part of the same picture. And so I want to try and show how that looks. Uh, now, mostly, uh, we just come up with a large uh, collection of conjectures uh, that uh, we can't prove. But they agree in the cases, uh, in sort of the small cases that we can prove, everything, all the conjectures agree astoundingly with, uh, with, uh, with what can be proven. And uh, they all, well, maybe not all, but for the most part, they've been uh, numerically tested. And we have fantastic uh, numeric agreement. And so there's, uh, I think it's pretty convincing that, uh, that the conjectures are correct. Uh, now, so really, I'm just going to mainly restrict to that sort of values, uh, distribution of values of L functions and moments, and distribution of zeros, including all their lower order terms. There's lots and lots of statistics of L functions that, um, are, uh, that I'm not going to mention here. There's been a fantastic amount of work in, in this subject, and so uh, I apologize if I don't mention your work or your favorite work. Uh, so I just want to start by giving a collection of examples of the kinds of statistics. And really, <coughs> this goes back possibly to, uh, well, Hardy and Littlewood, who uh, proved a, an asymptotic formula for the, for the mean square of the zeta function on the half line. Uh, if you believe the Riemann hypothesis, then that implies the Lindelof hypothesis that zeta doesn't grow too fast on the half line. For any epsilon, it should, zeta half plus i t should be smaller than t to the epsilon, basically. And then, uh, but if you average, you can get some nice results, like this, for example, or Ingham's fourth power moment. The fourth power of the zeta function, of the absolute value of the zeta function on the half line grows like log to the fourth of t times uh, 1 over 2 pi squared. Uh, <clears throat> we already heard uh, in the last talk about Montgomery's uh, pair correlation, uh, well, theorem and conjecture uh, that uh, if you have, so basically you have a test function uh, f and uh, you're sampling differences between ordinates of zeros, gamma 1 minus gamma 2, and you scale by log t over 2 pi so that you are stretching out that the average spacing between consecutive zeros is 1. We're, summing, we're assuming the Riemann hypothesis, summing over gammas, pairs between 0 and t. Then you get this uh, beautiful answer with this kernel 1 minus sine pi u over pi u squared. Montgomery proved this assuming the Fourier transform of f uh, is 0 when you're outside of minus 1, 1. But we believe this is true for, uh, uh, without that restriction. Uh, and uh, we already saw this picture of the least code data. Uh, <coughs> now, here's a result from Littlewood back in 1927, looking at the sort of uh, largest and smallest pass possible values of zeta on the one line. Zeta 1 plus i t never gets any bigger than 2 e to the gamma times log log t plus little o of 1, and never any smaller than e to the minus gamma zeta 2 over 2 log log t plus little of 1. And uh, Littlewood also proved a similar thing for, for Dirichlet characters. 
So chi here is a Dirichlet character mod Q, and you look at L1 chi, and you should be struck that you have sort of exactly the same thing here, but with a T in the first case, large T in zeta aspect, and large Q for the modulus of the, uh, of the, the L function there. And uh, this is L Littlewood's paper. He was actually looking at sort of uh, extreme kind of values of uh, the class number of quadratic fields, and of course the value of L1 chi uh, comes in to, to that. But um, I want to just point out, so this is 1927. I just want to point out the first sentence here. So we owe to Landau the important observation that some of the arguments used to discuss the behavior of the Riemann zeta function, zeta sigma plus i t, fixed sigma and large t, apply mutatis mutandis to the function L for real s and large k. Well, I was using q, but k. Okay, so Landau gets the credit for first noticing this phenomenon, which is really the very beginnings of thinking about families of L functions. And in this case, uh, symmetry type. What we would say today is that the Riemann zeta function in T aspect exhibits a unitary uh, symmetry, uh, just as the Dirichlet L functions, Ls chi, in chi aspect over all Dirichlet characters mod k is also part of a, a, a unitary family. So this is the early beginnings of that. And uh, here's Paley. By this time, they're actually calling it uh, k analogs. Uh, here's a result. So 1979, Goldfeld and Viola summing a pretty uh, general uh, L function uh, at the center point uh, and trying to average it over uh, with a quadratic twist. And so that's an example of a, so that's an example of a, a family and averaging over a family that's, that's very, I mean, it's very early in the literature, although it's really 1979. So it kind of took us, took number theorists, analytic number theorists a long time to do some of these averages, but that's certainly one of the early ones. Utila in 1981 averaged uh, L half chi d, uh, so quadratic Dirichlet characters at the, the center of the, uh, <coughs> of the uh, center, of the, at the central point, and get, now this is a first power, but and gets d log d. So in a little bit, we'll be interested in the powers of the log that appear here. And you see this is a log to the first. And he also did the uh, mean square. And uh, Jeff, you and Dorian did a very similar thing very early on also, maybe at the same time. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah. OK. Uh, sound later did the uh, third moment of these quadratic L functions. And that was his paper. Uh, Kowalski, Michelle, and Vanderkam studied uh, moments of L functions uh, from cusp form families. They weren't the first to do this, but they sort of went the furthest all the way up to the sort of fourth moment. And they were averaging uh, sort of the L functions at the central point of weight two uh, level Q. Uh, uh, modular forms, so Q is the, the critical parameter there. Uh, some other examples, like I said, this is you know, by no means complete or anything, but certainly uh, zero density estimates, how many zeros are there of the zeta function to the right of sigma and lower than T, or if you average over chi, what can you say about this? Selberg looked at S of T, the argument of zeta versus S of T chi, the argument of L of S chi, again, Dirich, all Dirichlet characters chi, and some of those over chi. Um, the large sieve allowed Huxley to actually bound an eighth moment of Dirichlet L functions, average over all chi mod q and all q's, uh, not all chi, primitive chi's mod q and all q up to big Q, and obtaining an estimate that's the right order of magnitude, including the, the log to the 16 uh, is correct here. Uh, Steve Gonick, in his uh, thesis, 
was doing a slightly different kind of moment, but averaging over zeros of zeta, the shifted moments of, of zeta, shifted by a little uh, alpha here. <coughs> uh, Ali Oslik, in his thesis, looked at paracorrelation of all the Dirichlet uh, L functions. We had large sieve estimates for Fourier coefficients of cusp forms, Desiree and Ivaniets. That kind of averaging is critical to uh, any sort of uh, moment or statistical things you want to do. Sarnak in 85, fourth moments of grossing characters. Oslak and Snyder did low-lying zeros of quadratic L functions, which actually um, really uh, predates the um, Katz and Sarnak uh, theory of families, and uh, it's, uh, it's sort of one of their premier examples uh, with um, uh, Wenji Luo and uh, uh, Ivaniets and Sarnak was about this, and, uh, but Oslik and Snyder actually did this first, which is kind of interesting. And then other, this is just the second moment of. Uh, <coughs> so um, one of the things that happened in this story is that, uh, okay, so after Montgomery's um, paracorrelation, which was in the early 70s, it took a really long time for number theorists to sort of pick up on the, end cor on the correlation ideas. And finally, Hedgehog uh, looked at triple correlation, and about the same time, uh, Rudnick and Sarnak were looking at uh, n correlation and um, trying to see if the n correlation of zeros of the zeta function matched up with the, the GUE predictions from random matrix theory and physics. And uh, sure enough, uh, they matched up in the limited range of Fourier transform of their test functions. But what they found is that no matter what individual L function you took, when you went up height t, when you went up for large t, you always got exactly the same uh, in correlation function. And they were expecting, well, you've got you know elliptic curves, and you've got some CM ones, and you know you have various kinds of Sato Tate distributions for coefficients. Surely the way the coefficients of the Dirichlet series of your L function, the way they behave should have some influence on uh, the uh, statistics of zeros, the correlation of zeros high up. And they found that it didn't. It's the same. You go up in any fixed L function, you go up in T aspect and you get the same statistics. So now we would say, well, those are all a, a unitary family. Any fixed L function in a large T aspect, you're going to see uh, unitary statistics. <coughs> But uh, I believe that actually prompted then Katz and Sarnak to look more carefully into uh, the theory, sort of symmetry types of families. And they looked at um, uh, function field families where they could compute sort of the mo monodromy of these families and realized that they get uh, the classical compact groups, uh, the uh, orthogonal groups, uh, and the uh, and symplectic unitary symplectic group compact groups with Haar measures are the things that uh, actually govern statistics of the uh, of the zeros spacings of uh, function field families, and they're able to to prove this using Deline's equidistribution results. And by the way, these ensembles are different from the ones that Michael Berry was showing in his talk. He had uh, beta equals one, two, and four for the different repulsions. Uh, but in number theory, the things that show up are all beta equals two. Okay, so they're different from, so CUE is the same, so unitary is the same, but the CSE and the COE are different from the statistics that you get from the uh, special orthogonal group and the uh, unitary symplectic groups, which are all, all have the quadratic repulsion. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, yeah. Okay, so here's an early, uh, just a little clip from an early lecture on this subject. This is uh, 1996 uh, at the AIM conference in Seattle on the Riemann hypothesis. Some of you were there. Michael was there. Uh, John Keating was there. Steve was there. Anybody else? So maybe that's it. Oh, Jeff. Yes, of course. Zero closest to the point of the functional equation, renormalized, of course, so that the mean will be one. Everything is always renormalized. That's part of the scale. 
will converge to these limits that I'm saying there when we can identify them. So for the hyperelliptic family, which had, uh, we already knew what the, the infinite, the monodromy is, it's the infinite symplectic group, or this limit of symplectic groups. But you see, the hyperelliptic is something I can quickly run back, so I want to now finally return back to the Riemann zeta function, or the Richelieu all functions only, for the time being. And this is just the beginning, uh, unfortunately, if this were a few weeks later, I'd have much more uh, evidence. I only have a little bit of evidence. In fact, most of this was done by hand. And then my wife showed me that my computer actually has a calculator on it. That sped things up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain why. Uh, uh, this uh, Rubenstein's evolved here, but he went to his brother's wedding. I, I couldn't understand that. <laughs> he left me. Okay. Yeah, I like that part about Mike going to his. But, um, I mean, Sarnak's all about, uh, you know, L functions and family, so he should have been happy that uh, Mike had family values and went to his brother's wedding. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this is their paper where they first uh, described this theory, uh, zeta functions and symmetry, and it just put, I mean, we sort of had a, all these, uh, examples in the background, and we sort of knew that this kind of thing was going on, but they really sort of honed it to, uh, you know, they really sort of said exactly uh, what the situation was and really changed the way that we think about these things and identifying symmetry types with families and, and helping us to make predictions about how things behave, how the moments work, and how. Uh, Things like one-level densities of L functions, of families of L functions behave. So uh, <coughs> it's, uh, right. So the question of what exactly is a family is, uh, is a little bit tricky, especially over, over number fields. Over function fields, you have this monodromy group you can calculate or you can get Nick Katz to calculate. Um, but over number fields, we just sort of look at things and uh, try to, associate a, a, a symmetry type with them, and it, it seems to work. Certainly for small, the first examples, everything works just fine. In general, uh, in a more generality, uh, so uh, Nic uh, Nicholas Templier and Sarnak and uh, some other people have, uh, uh, have looked into more carefully what it actually means uh, to, be, uh, to have uh, symmetry types for uh, for families and looking at uh, automorphic forms. Uh, Nicola, where are you? Oh, there you are. Yeah, is that uh, more or less accurate? <laughs> I guess that's a yes. Okay. Uh, <coughs> all right, so unitary family, any L function in T aspect or any L function twisted by all Dirichlet characters. Those are kind of the simplest examples of unitary family. Orthogonal, we'll take an L function, take the, a collection of L functions Cusp forms of, say, a given weight, say, fixed weight and large level, or large weight and fixed level. Or if you take one cusp form L function, like an elliptic curve, say, and twist by all quadratic characters. So these are examples that give uh, orthogonal symmetry. And for symplectic, the two sort of simplest things are Dirichlet L functions for primitive quadratic characters, or uh, symmetric square L functions of cusp forms of a given weight and level. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, the uh, sort of density conjecture would be something like this. So you have a family, say indexed by F in, in script F, and you have uh, something, let's say, the analytic conductor, CF, basically the log of the log of Q times T, something or other like that. And you look at the Fs with conductor, you sort of order the Fs in your family with a a uh, parameter Q that's going to go off to infinity. For each LF, you look at the zeros, resume the Riemann hypothesis, to make things simpler, half plus I gamma F. And then you take a test function, a phi, and uh, for an individual F, you form this sum. You sum over the gamma F's phi of gamma F log CF over 2 pi. Now you can think of phi as just being sort of a compactly supported test function, so you're really sampling the low, the low zeros, the low-lying zeros, the so small gammas are registering 
the first few zeros. And then now, um, now you take this quantity D and average it over the family. So divide by the number of things in the family and the sum over all the things in the family of that. And what we expect is that the limit as Q goes to infinity of this sum should equal the integral of your test function phi against some uh, one level density function W of F, something that only depends on the symmetry type of the family. And uh, for orthogonal, that should just be a one plus half delta X. For symplectic, one minus sine two pi X over two pi X. For even orthogonal and odd orthogonal, you should get these. And uh, so this, this comes out of the, uh, the Katz uh, Sarnak philosophy. And here's some pictures of, uh, due to Mike Rubenstein, <coughs> that shows some agreement of, uh, of the data with, uh, with the predicted symmetry type. So this would be symplectic one level density, which was one minus sine two pi x over two pi x. You're looking at low lying zeros in a symplectic family. In this case, Mike was looking at zeros of quadratic L functions between 10 to the 12th and 10 to the 12th plus 200,000. And, um, and, and comparing the data. And you see it's, it's a nice agreement. This is the kind of graph that Sarnak wished that he had during that Seattle meeting, but his graphs were actually much more primitive based on very few examples done uh, on the calculator on his computer, apparently. And then, uh, so this is uh, L tau S chi D. So you've taken the, the Ramanujan tau function, take that L function, and twisted by even characters, uh, even quadratic characters in this range. And uh, here you see the, um, this is what? This is one plus sine two pi x over two pi x. Yeah. And then uh, <coughs> the sort of paper that really kind of explained this uh, is due to uh, Wenji Lo, Henrik Ivaniets, and Sarnak in this IHES proceedings, low-lying zeros of families of L functions, where they went through um, several different families and uh, proved, either unconditionally or using the Riemann hypothesis, that uh, the one-level densities match up with the prediction from uh, the predictions given in the, the Katz-Sarnak paper on function fields. And they had to go quite far they had to really go to great lengths to, to prove their results for Fourier transforms that had long enough support so that you could distinguish the, uh, the different types of families. So they had to go beyond sort of the minus one to one in support of the Fourier transform. And so a couple of things they prove. Looking at an orthogonal case, uh, they get all the way out to sort of minus two, two and symmetric squares of these minus three halves, three halves. And these were enough to distinguish the different symmetry types and so give pretty convincing evidence. Okay, <coughs> so there's sort of two kinds of statistics we're looking at, moments and statistics of zeros, which are correlations or level densities. And so what I wanna describe next is how we can sort of in any family give uh, very precise uh, conjectures for any sort of moment that you wanna do or any sort of calculation uh, having to do with zeros. All right, so uh, uh, but before I do that, I just mentioned that, so one of the problems here is that, so this is Z of T, that's Hardy's Z function, zeta half plus IT multiplied by something to make it real on the half line, but with the same absolute value as zeta. And uh, it's unruly. And when you're looking at moments, it's precisely these gigantic values that contribute to the moments. And so it's really tricky to be able to nail down what the moments are. You're saying, when you do that, you're saying a lot about these, uh, these large values. Uh, here's another one. Uh, Jonathan Bober and Gaif Hari have uh, looked up to height 10 to the 30th and found some just uh, phenomenal uh, 
values of the zeta function. So here in this graph, I mean, you can't even really represent it. It's just, it's almost a cartoon, right? It's just zero and then goes up to 17,000 and back down to zero, <laughs> right? And so uh, a value like that has enormous weight when you, you're taking a 2K moment, you know, sixth moment or something like that, and that gets to the sixth power, and that gives you like a lot of the mass that comes into the, the sixth moment. So in fact, it's fairly remarkable that, I mean, the answers I'm gonna give you are somewhat complicated, but complicated in the sense of they're symmetric functions of a bunch of variables that take a few minutes to, to wrap your head around, but uh, in fact, the results are remarkably simple. And the fact that um, this such erratic behavior uh, leads to something in the end that's, that is so simple it, is pretty remarkable. And the, only, the only other thing I would say is, with behavior like this, that may also partly explain why it's so hard to prove the Riemann hypothesis, right? I mean, the, think about the functions that we know that have all real zeros. You know, they're like Bessel functions or something like that. They're very, very tame, and they don't behave in any sort of unpredictable way like this. I mean, the, the collection of functions where we can really say all their zeros are real is, is pretty limited and pretty tame. And, you know, nothing like this. So, uh, okay, so back to moments. Uh, so a little bit of history. So, <coughs> Omic Ghosh and I uh, just made sort of a general conjecture about sort of the 2 kth moment that basically, well, it was well known that it should have size log to the k squared. Now that k squared is actually a feature of, of the unitary symmetry for orthogonal and symplectic, we'll see a different quadratic exponent in the moments. So log to the k squared over k squared factorial. There's an arithmetic factor, which for integers k is simple to describe. Just sort of take the k minus first squared, this Euler product, which is absolutely convergent, because the one over p terms cancel, basically. So it's like one plus big O of one over p squared. But so the content of this conjecture really is that we thought that there is some unknown geometric factor out front that um, it should be an integer multiple of that sort of arithmetic factor times the, the obvious log to the k squared over k squared factorial. And that was based on, we thought gk sort of represented how many partial sums of the zeta function of length t are necessary to capture the really large values. And that was sort of our th uh, thinking about this as kind of a geometric factor and also why it should be an integer. Uh, then in 92, we actually came up with a conjecture for the sixth moment, which is just like that, uh, uh, what was on the previous page, but identifying the G3 is 42. And then uh, Steve Gonick and I in 98 uh, conjectured uh, the eighth moment of the zeta function, same thing but with a number 24,024. And then uh, Steve and I got stuck and could not do uh, the 10th moment. We basically got a negative answer for, uh, for the 10th and, and higher moments. And so uh, we put that aside. <coughs> there's a sixth moment, there's a, our eighth moment. Uh, the, the stuff that we did with, uh, with, with Steve relied on uh, a paper of uh, Steve Gonick and Dan Goldson about mean value theorems for long Dirichlet polynomials. So uh, you sort of have the Montgomery Vaughan, if you're integrating up to height t and you have a Dirichlet polynomial of length shorter than t, you just get the diagonal stuff. But if you go up to, if your length of your polynomial is up to t squared, then you should bring in coefficient correlations. In this case, things like summation d3 of n times d3 of n plus one. And so that's how we came up with our, uh, our, our uh, 24,024. Oops. Yeah. And uh, right, so we did these coefficient correlations like this. So number theorists do not know how to do this asymptotically when k is three or more. dk of n is a coefficient of zeta s to the k, the nth coefficient of zeta s to the k. And we don't know how to do these when, it, when k is three or more, unfortunately. But we do know how to conjecture these. And we can do that from the, uh, I think its simplest way is what's called the delta method, 
of Duke, Friedlander, and Ivaniets from this paper called the Quadratic Divisor Problem. So that's a good place to read about the, the, the delta method. Okay. <coughs> well then, so we were stuck, and then um, along came um, Keating and Snaith that actually, uh, using random matrix theory, were, at, were able to, to, to conjecture all of the GKs. So that was, uh, that was pretty dramatic. And uh, in fact, that's, that began, that problem began at that same conference I just showed you the video from, the, the Seattle one. Uh, at that meeting, Sarnak uh, challenged Keating to uh, explain the, the 42. And so he went back and uh, asked Nina Snaith, his graduate student, to um, calculate the moments of characteristic polynomials of unitary matrices. And, uh, and that's what led to this. And uh, in 1998, there was a second AIM meeting at the Schrodinger Institute in Vienna. And John Keating was talking about uh, this work. And I was going to talk about the work with Steve. And I saw John and met Nina just a few minutes before that talk and said, well, did you get 24,024 for the eighth moment? And John said, well, what's, you know, what's, they had things written in a different way. And we're not concerned about that particular integer. And so we had to do this calculation on the spot that, that did, after a, a little bit of trial and error, did result in the, the 24,024. And, uh, and so I think that was actually a pretty dramatic moment in some ways. And the combination of that work that they did together with the um, Katz and Sarnak work on symmetries of families sort of propelled, I mean, they launched this subject into um, a uh, kind of dizzying state for the next uh, 15 years of things that have gone on since then and continue to happen. But so here's what Keating and Snaith did. They uh, averaged over the unitary family with Haar measure the 2 kth moment of the characteristic polynomial of the matrices here. And, and what that means when you write out the Weyl integration formula, it means calculating this multiple integral. You have a Vandermond here, that's part of the hard measure. You have a characteristic polynomial here to the 2k. The eigenvalues are all in the unit circle, so they're written as e to the i theta n. They, theta n's go from zero to two pi, and they have this, they don't like to be close to each other, which is measure with the <coughs> square. You get smaller measure when they're close together. And they gave this uh, exact formula, this beautiful formula, n plus 1, n plus 2 squared, up to n plus k to the k. And then you go back down, and the denominator is exactly the same, uh, but with n equals 0. So these are interesting polynomials, by the way, also. Uh, you know how Chebyshev gets uh, primes, gives estimates for primes by looking at sort of binomial coefficients. Well, these things are really interesting to look at primes also. Uh, anyway. They do this using Selberg's integral. The right side is asymptotic to n to the k squared over that denominator, because the degree is just k squared. And if you write that as gk n to the k squared over k squared factorial, then you find these numbers gk. And the missing number for the tenth moment is uh, 701,149,020. So that number should appear in the, in the tenth moment of, the, of of, of the Riemann zeta function. And the calculation we had to do sort of involved uh, calculating this thing with k equals 4 and producing this number. Anyway. Uh, so in other families, OK, so uh, right. So then uh, uh, the idea was, uh, to do that matri the random matrix calculations for other families. And so David Farmer and I kind of helped set that up by giving some examples of different families and saying what we thought sort of the powers on the log should be and just sort of kind of running down a, a framework for other families. And um, we thought that the power on the log should only depend uh, on the symmetry type of the family the arithmetic, and the same with the, the GK, should only depend on the uh, symmetry type of the family. The AK will depend on the family itself. 
So for cusp forms, we looked at a couple examples, quadratic characters and cusp forms and orthogonal and symplectic. And the geometric factors uh, then, which were calculated uh, by Keating and Snaith, uh, by doing the corresponding integrals over those groups uh, come out like this. And the, uh, uh, the powers and the exponents for orthogonal should be k times k minus 1 over 2, and for, quad, for symplectic, k times k plus 1 over 2. Um, <coughs> by, um, instead of the k squared for unitary. And I should mention that uh, also uh, that by using multiple Dirichlet series, um, oh, maybe, oh yeah, okay, actually, uh, I'll mention that in, this, uh, in a minute. Okay, so examples, so, so what the prediction then would be for quadratic L functions, for example, would be sort of this. You use the, the G from symplectic, which has these values, the arithmetic factor is a little complicated looking, and then the power on the log. Uh, and so they, they did that for, for L functions. Uh, <coughs> now, um, there was a slight difficulty uh, with the new conjectures of Keating and Snaith in that, um, I mean, they agreed with everything we knew, but we could not actually test them numerically. They were sort of untestable. And the problem is that, um, like for the 42, it's like a, the, you have a leading term that involves 42 and then log to the ninth, but there's also a term that has size log to the eighth and log to the seventh and so on. So there's terms that are just one log down, and when you try to check numerically, it just fails miserably. So we really wanted to test the conjecture and, uh, and figure out what all the lower order terms in the polynomials were. Uh, and uh, there is some history for that because Ingham, for example, had lower order terms for the mean square. It's not just log t, but it's log t over 2 pi plus 2 gamma minus 1. And he also uh, wrote it in, in a different form with little shifts. Zeta half plus it plus alpha, zeta half minus it plus beta is this, okay? Uh, and this is actually, so this is back from the 1920s. This is actually the, sort of the key, in a way, to the thing that we want. By putting little shifts in, we're able to see the symmetries of, uh, of what's going on here. And then when you let alpha and beta go to zero on the right side, then you recover this formula, right? So each of these, had, there's a simple pole here and a simple pole here when alpha and beta are zero. When you put them together, the pole cancels, and you can take the limit as alpha and beta go to zero, and you get exactly this formula here. And uh, Heath Brown had done something with the fourth moment of zeta in 1979, and you get a fourth degree polynomial, and he had a power savings. Uh, that's his paper. At some point, I decided to actually calculate what that, exactly what that fourth degree polynomial was. And, and this is it. Uh, now, I, I kind of liked it because all the constants involved zeta either at two or at one with, in the form of gammas, derivatives. But it's like there's no way you're going to be able to generalize that to like a sixth moment. That's just completely hopeless. But uh, together with uh, Farmer, Keating, Rubenstein, and Snaith, uh, we figured out how to do this. And we have this paper, Integral Moments of L Functions. It's a recipe, basically, for how to conjecture moments in, in sort of any family. And it gives all the lower order terms with what we believe is a power savings. And I should say that around the same time, uh, Diakonu, Hofstein, and uh, Goldfeld, by a multiple Dirichlet series approach, came up with uh, similar conjectures. Uh, okay, so that was Ingham. Now there's, uh, so we were guided by random matrix theory as we were doing this. So uh, let's say you have a, a unitary matrix X with eigenvalues like this. Then the, the characteristic polynomial, let's say, is lambda X. Uh, that's not completely conventional characteristic polynomial, but it is a polynomial that vanishes whenever S is one of the eigenvalues. X star is a conjugate transpose of X. And so you, if you look at this integral, 
integral over u of n lambda x e to the minus alpha, lambda x star e to the minus beta, you get an exact formula. Now, you can't do this uh, with Selberg's integral the way um, John and Nina had done for, without shifts. So you have to get to it, you have to do it something different. And we do this in general, uh, but it's a little bit more elaborate, but it, it doesn't go via Selberg's uh, integral. But what you notice is the similarity between these two formulas. Z here is uh, one over one minus e to the minus x, which has a, a simple zero, a simple pole of residue one at x equals zero. So it plays the role of zeta one plus x. Okay, and L, the log t over two pi, plays the role of n, the matrix size. And that's the same as identifying the density of zeros with the density of eigenvalues. Density of zeros at height t with the density of eigenvalues in, uh, in an n by n matrix and equating those parameters from the, the two theories, which is what uh, Keating and Snaith had done. Okay. And uh, now, let's see. Uh, so for the, you can do the same thing for the fourth moment. And so once this is written down, then you actually know how to proceed into the general situation. And it looks a little complicated, but if you just uh, stare at it for a minute, this tells you kind of everything you need to know. All right, and that is, <coughs> so it's like a fourth shifted moment. We have two x's and two x stars. The shifts are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And this is exactly equal to this, sum of six terms. Uh, each term is composed of a, a big, a capital Z of two variables, semicolon, two other variables, where you take little z of anything to the left plus anything to the right. And so you get a four of these things, alpha, gamma, alpha, delta, beta, gamma, beta, delta. And then you um, add up six of these things where you can think of it as being, you kind of swap alpha with minus gamma and gamma with minus alpha right here. And when you do that, you put it in e to the minus n alpha plus gamma. Do the same thing with alpha and delta, beta and gamma, beta and delta, and then both pairs. Okay, and now you can imagine how you might do this for, the, the same thing works for, for sixth moment. Now you have an alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, beta one, beta two, beta three, let's say. And the total number of these kinds of swappings you can do is, um, well, one plus three choose one squared plus three choose two squared plus three choose three squared. So one plus nine plus nine plus one, which is 20, is also, that adds up to two K choose two, when K is three, so six choose three. You get 20 terms uh, in the six, six moment. But uh, for the zeta function, this is actually a theorem, and this goes back to looking at a paper of um, Motohashi. He has an exact formula, an explicit formula for the fourth moment of the Riemann zeta function. It's really quite amazing. Uh, <coughs> no error term whatsoever. But he begins by looking at sort of shifted things, and then he eventually sets all the shifts to zero, and he does it before he actually notices that there's this kind of symmetry uh, in the main terms. If he had noticed that, he might have, may have uh, conjectured this whole thing beforehand. But it works just the same way. There's now an arithmetic factor, and uh, you can do this sort of arbitrarily I won't uh, sort of belabor this, and then an arbitrary moments of zeta, any sort of number of zeta s pluses and uh, one minus s's. And uh, <coughs> we actually computed all of the, uh, numerically, all the terms of all the way up to around uh, maybe the 20, 28th power of zeta, I think, something like that. Uh, so Mike calculated all these things. And here it is for the ninth moment. This is the ninth degree polynomial. See, this top coefficient is the 42. You can see how tiny it is, which is why um, numerically you can integrate, say, the zeta to the six up to two million. Uh, our so this is what you get. This is our conjecture. And if you just did the 42, you get something that's way, way off. 
So, uh, and part of it is because the, first, the 42 is actually a really tiny coefficient. You have to go very, very, very far out in T before that would really start to dominate. And uh, I just want to say that using uh, sort of something called the asymptotic large sieve uh, with the Ivaniets and sound, we actually prove a six moment of sort of all characters chi mod Q and Q's up to big Q with a little tiny uh, average. And we actually produce uh, exactly all the nine terms identical to what the conjecture predicts and with a power uh, eight savings in the error term. And I think this is in some ways the most convincing evidence for this theory is that, that those ninth degree polynomials exactly work. And so we recovered the 42 in particular. Uh, and there's our paper. And then uh, sound uh, student uh, Chandy and Lee then uh, assuming, <laughs> assuming GRH, we're able to recover the leading term to give the 24,024 for the eighth moment of Dirichlet L functions. Okay, uh, well, all right. <coughs> so that's a lot about moments. So now I want to turn to, to zeros. And uh, somehow I have to convince you that, um, or I want to try and convince you that we can look at the zeros in, in sort of the same light. I always thought they were completely different, but um, now I think really it's just part of the same story. Uh, and so this begins with a conjecture of David Farmer about an average of these kinds of, uh, an average that has zetas in the denominator. Now here, gamma and delta should have positive real parts. We're assuming the Riemann hypothesis so that you stay away from integrating over any zeros. And Farmer made a conjecture that this should be asymptotic to this kind of thing. And it seemed uh, r pretty outlandish at first, but it turns out that uh, Martin Zernbauer from uh, <coughs> Cologne knew how to integrate ratios of characteristic polynomials. And you get sort of exactly the same kind of thing uh, as we saw before. And this matches up exactly with farmers. Uh, and <coughs> so we realized now, I didn't tell you how to do this recipe, but we realized that you could apply that recipe sort of um, mantra to, uh, to these ratios, and it works just the same. And so we could actually produce a conjecture for this two zetas over two zetas that has not just that beginning uh, asymptotic terms, but actually includes all of the arithmetic factors as well. And it works exactly the same way as the procedure for conjecturing moments, the thing that we call the recipe. So the idea is the recipe works for ratios too. And so this is what it looks like, but now you have zetas in, in, in place of farmer's conjecture, we just had alpha plus delta up here and beta plus gamma, no arithmetic factor. But now we think this is actually correct with a power savings error term, possibly uh, t to the one half, although that may be uh, asking too much. <coughs> and there's exactly what that Euler product from that last formula looks like. And, in, and you can do the same thing, but in general, uh, in random matrix theory and in uh, zeta theory. I won't, these are a little bit complicated, but you can write down exactly what it is and it just kind of works the same way. Uh, yeah, that's still the same thing. And now, <coughs> once you have zetas in the denominator, then you can do Cauchy integrals to capture information about zeros because you have singularities wherever the denominators vanish. And so you can start to average uh, zeros. It gives a completely different way to do something like pair correlation. You just take the ratios formula and you integrate around and, um, and produce formulas for, like, for pair correlation. So for example, uh, Okay, so we already saw that Montgomery's correlation. We saw that picture. Uh, <coughs> so here's some pictures to show that uh, even though this looks uh, like identical, like you could never ask for anything better, there's actually some differences between, if you look closely, there's some differences between sort of the uh, empirical and the expected. Now part of that is because n is finite. You haven't let n go to infinity even though it's way up at 10, 10 to the 20. Oh, oh sorry, this is, not, uh, this is not matrix size, 10 to the 23rd. This is 
t, height t is 10 to the 23rd. <coughs> and part of it is because it's actually zeros of zeta, it's not matrices. And so there are arithmetical fluctuations. And uh, if you just look at raw data, this isn't based on too many zeros, but if you look at what you expect, then you actually get these, you get a funny dip down here, and it's right around 14, which is the height of the first zero of zeta, okay? And the, uh, and the numerics actually follows that right along. And uh, Bogomoni and Keating were the first to, uh, to discover this, and they gave several different proofs of this formula, which uh, Snaith and I uh, then reproduced using the ratios conjecture, uh, which uh, somehow we felt like that put it on firmer ground. I don't, I don't know what you'd say about that, John, but <laughs> whatever. Anyway, and so you can, uh, there's no restriction on the test function. There's no scaling here. This is exactly what we think you get from averaging a test function over differences of zeros. So it's square root of t here. And then now you don't see, any, now you just see sort of noise, the difference between theory and numerics. Uh, Hedgehog did triple correlation. This is sort of what triple correlation would look like without any primes. Uh, but now if you throw in the primes and get sort of the interesting extra features, this is a picture that Nina made, um, that shows uh, shadows like this right here, this is a cross at 14, the height of the zero, the zeta function, and that's 14. And uh, this is uh, a, a uh, that also uh, is a line that adds up to 14, the first zero, the second zero. And so you see this sort of interesting uh, collection of features, uh, oh, which, oh, by the way, I guess I forgot to point out, but where does that come? <laughs> uh, let me, sorry, let me just go back for a second. Okay. Where does that come from? Oh, I should have. Did I, uh, oops, sorry. Oh, I'm not liking what I'm doing here. Oh yeah, okay, so that comes from, um, from this, this term here, the zeta prime over zeta prime at one plus i r. Well, if r is a zero of the Riemann zeta function, then at one half plus i r, you'd have a pole. And so it's that dip down at the zero is because of the influence of the sort of nearby pole. And so at all the zeros, you see that same kind of dip like that. All right, so I need to wrap this up. Okay, so you could do, uh, again, using ratios, you can do that in other families too. So if you wanted to do one level density for quadratic L functions, uh, this is in a paper, Applications of the Ratios Conjecture by Snaith and myself. Um, and uh, now you see a feature, zeta prime over zeta one plus two i t that occurs here. And uh, this is a, a uh, picture by Mike Rubenstein. He's taken the zeros of the quadratic L functions, L s chi d, but d between minus 20,000 and 15,000, and up to a height around 23 or something, and just plotted a dot at every single zero, okay? And so you look at that, and you see these white shadows are from the one level density, sort of the one minus sine two pi x over two pi x creates this kind of thing. And then uh, they go up like that just because of the varying d's. Uh, and then, but, the, but the, the zeta prime over zeta one plus two i t is represented by this shadow here, okay? That's at seven, which is half of the height of the first zero, and then 10.5 is half of the 21, and so on. And so you see this interesting thing where the zeros of the quadratic Dirichlet L functions kind of know about the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Okay, and now in my, uh, I'm supposed to finish right now, but let me just take uh, two seconds to say that um, <coughs> So Keating and I are working on a project that we think will allow us to use number theory again in the form of divisor correlations to now recover the higher moments, the place where Steve and I got stuck many years ago. So in particular, like the tenth moment, for example. And it involves kind of a uh, Hardy Littlewood method where, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, and, and this idea is actually 
goes back to some work of Bogomoni and Keating when, where they recovered um, sort of the full incorrelation formula from hardy littlewood prime pair conjectures. And it's quite an amazing uh, couple of papers. The combinatorics are um, staggering. And the ideas in there, I mean, it's, um, I, yeah, it's hard to imagine how they sort of work their way through this. But uh, um, I think it's actually relevant to, even though this is for zeros, I think the same ideas are relevant now to, um, uh, to, to moment predictions. And when put in the context of sort of the, um, the recipe and the ratios conjecture, sort of makes the whole thing uh, more a sort of a more uh, coherent theory in a way. But uh, so I won't spend much time on this. But let's say you want to integrate a long Dirichlet polynomial. Now we're thinking of x as being between t squared and t cubed. And suppose your coefficients are convolutions. Okay, then you could rewrite the sum in this way uh, and with a w hat of your, your weight function. And now the idea is to um, take a large parameter and, and partition your uh, unit uh, interval up into uh, Fairy fractions, a Fairy series of order Q. And what we want to do is kind of look at, well, we have this M1 times M2 minus N1 times N2 is not, is say, not too big. We somehow want to dissect that up into um, kind of a circle method where we want to split it into sort of two convolution problems and then for each convolution problem use a circle method to approximate uh, possibly big numbers, say M1 and N1, by some small numbers, say uh, big M over big N or A over Q or something like that. So it's like a, it's like a hardy Littlewood circle method here. And uh, so, uh, and so that's what we do. Uh, all right, I've, I've kind of run out of time here. But um, basically, uh, in general, we think that, um, that this will work, and we're writing all this up. We've got three papers that I think are on the archive so far that deal with uh, lower, uh, with, with just sort of second and fourth moments. But uh, the last one brings sort of these extra terms into, uh, into play. And we're working in general now on the sort of general t squared to t cubed in the case where uh, your coefficients are a correlation. And doing the circle method to now recover um, the term, the missing terms from number theory. So we see where they are. And uh, I, I guess the way I think of it is, you know, we've tried, we work really hard trying to do the second moment, fourth moment, sixth moment, or whatever. And we sort of pick out the terms that contribute, and then we spend like all of our time trying to bound the error terms and hoping that they cancel and don't add up to too much. Whereas this approach, I think, um, sort of takes all the terms and sorts them into bins according to this sort of circle method in a way that everything is contributing. So we're trying not to throw anything away. We're just trying to put it into a spot where it will combine with other terms and lead to something that we recognize uh, from the recipe as, as belonging there. And uh, the sort of connection with the recipe, and if you remember all those sort of swap terms, well, if you don't swap anything, those are diagonal terms. If you just swap one term, those are the correlation things that Steve and I looked at, the straight correlations. But if you swap two things, those correspond to terms that come from when your, uh, your function is a convolution of two things, and you split it up into two, and, and then you recover the, uh, those two swap terms. And so that's what we're missing from uh, the work that we did before, is we didn't see how to identify the terms with two swaps. And so all of this has um, been driven by kind of uh, using random matrix theory as a model and seeing how things work and setting things up in a nice symmetric way. And so I think it's been a very uh, uh, positive uh, relationship. So uh, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.